That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about Sebastian, the directorial debut of Mika Mikola, which just premiered at the 2024 Sundance Film Festival in the World Dramatic Competition category. What is Sebastian about? Max, a 25-year-old aspiring writer living in London, begins a double life as a sex worker in order to research his debut novel. What's your pull quote? An escapist, sex-tinged, rags-to-riches fantasy unwittingly tangled in its unconscious privilege of whiteness and youth's inherent naivete excude, ex exudes an authenticity in self-obsessed pretensions. Mine, Sebastian is a frustratingly accurate depiction of an insufferable 20-something undermining his goals by way of his unexplained decisions. So, the story's pretty simple. Max is this 25-year-old living in London. He is an accomplished writer. He works for what we're told is like a reputable magazine. And he's a published writer. He mm -hmm. has some of his short stories in print. And he's been told by that publisher that they will print his first book. And he has explained to them, because he's provided some uh, pages, that it will be about uh, sex work in the digital age. But what he's not telling anyone is that he's actually working as a prostitute to get some content for this book. Named Sebastian for the patron gay of saints. Patron and, saints of gay. And his, uh, yeah, his escort name is Sebastian. So we see him have a few, take a few clients, these older gentlemen, one of whom he ends up developing a connection with. Played by Jonathan Hyde. But during this time, he's also sort of, I mean, I guess undermining his actual career by, I, he ruins an opportunity to interview Brett Easton Ellis. And then ultimately is fired after he bungles um, an interview with like a tech company or something. Then his writings sort of take a turn because the publisher has said like what we really would like and what we think our readers would like is to hear about these, this sex work from like a first person point of view. But Sebastian is hesitant because he doesn't seem to want to align himself. Like he's very scared about being seen as a sex worker, which we can get into. And then he starts to transition his writing into developing a relationship with one of his clients. And this is what the publisher says they don't want. Mm -hmm. So the climax of the story is the publisher basically saying, like, you're not giving us what we want, so I'm afraid we're not going to be able to publish your book. But then he has a change of heart, and then we see him write in the first person, and then we cut to some time has passed, and his book is published, so it looks like he's a success. The end. Yeah, very. It reminded me of Theodore Dreiser's sister Carrie, which is a rags to riches story about this girl that becomes a stage star. And it's like, uh, okay. <laughs> we talked a lot about this movie after it was done, which is a good thing. Uh -huh. I was very frustrated with this character, but I think mainly because I feel like I know this person. At the moment that the film's showing us that he might have hit like a rock bottom where he's stuck in Brussels. It reminded me of that song, Common People, where it's like, you could call any number of people at any time to come get you out of this situation. But he reminds me of so many people I've known who sure. are just, yeah, like, they're the center of their own little sitcom and everything's happening to them and everything's drama and everything's a, a, a major decision, even though there's no logic to the actual decisions you're making. <laughs> But somehow you think everything that's happening to you is, uh, like, planned. I don't know. But, so, yeah, I I didn't like him, he, per se. He actually, this is like the art house uh, version of the character that Augustus Prue plays in Dear David. It, kind of, yeah. But especially with the, the, the relationship he has with his co-worker in this film, Amna, another writer, and how he is kind of the black hole that can't be bothered to kind of uh, give his colleagues the same attention that he feels he deserves. Yeah. So ultimately, I didn't... I think the film's a great conversation piece, but ultimately I was left kind of annoyed by this character. I found him very boring. Well, because I'm not ever led to understand... The stakes are so the, low. The stakes are so <laughs> low. And to me, it's clear that he... More than th this... Um, clandestine research operation is more of a ruse for him to explore his own 
sexuality that he feels he's been unable to thus far which in 2024 seems kind of archaic, even though we get snippets of a very conservative mother that's supportive, but but maybe stymied him in a certain way. But I'm, I'm never led to understand uh, why exactly he's doing this and why if it's found out that that's a bad thing. Right, so I would start with that. I, I, it's never explained how he came to the decision to become a prostitute so that he could write about sex work. And I feel like that I'm sure there was a very deliberate reason why they didn't want to include that, but the end result left me feeling like I don't like I don't care about him. I don't the only sense I got was that he he's under the impression that his mother wouldn't like it. But the problem with that is at a point he goes to visit his mother and she says, "Oh, I read that one story you wrote." And he's like, "What story? How did you read that?" And the mom goes, "Well, I know how to use the internet." So then it's like if he's under the impression that his mom wouldn't even be able to know how to find some of his work, then I guess I don't know why he's so worried about her finding out about his book. And then if his book does get published and it's popular enough that she would find out, wouldn't that be a good thing? And also, why does your mom have to think that you were a prostitute to write a book about prostitutes? Right. You could have just said you did research and wrote a book. And it, it's dancing around this, you know, in the literary world, something like autofiction is kind of a, a dirty, demeaning word, at least in some circles, which is really what he's doing. Uh, but the snippets of interviews we get with Brett Easton Ellis that, it, that he's preparing for an interview he ultimately doesn't get to do, that is something that is, uh, Easton Ellis was accused of as well, like how can this feel so realistic without you actually having experienced it? And you know, this Sebastian character, Max slash Sebastian, is really just trans transcribing what happens to him. It's like, <laughs> I, which I find kind of amusing. Well, because there's not a lot of creativity no. to it, which I, I'm going to get to in a second. I'm just going to go through my notes. I did, the actor playing Max slash Sebastian. Uh, Rudy Molika? I thought he did a fine job. He reminds me of if you mix uh, like Joel Kinnaman and Tilda Swinton. Yeah, there was that Tilda Swinton jawline, I think, especially from a distance. Yeah. But I mean, I, I I think he fit the role well as like a nice looking 20 something who could probably sell his body for sex. And I did think he read as he could also be this sort of like literary mind. Although the samples of his writing don't feel extraordinary to me. And I'm someone who's not a competent writer. So it's odd to me that we're supposed to believe that he's like sought after as this young new talent but well the way that the, especially the women seem to be going gaga for him is like there's some cliched there are some cliched passages in there the website he's on to escort is called dreamy guys and i so something that we talked about as well is i think that we should have why don't we see him hire an escort if you're doing research, at one point I thought, I assume that's where it's going because he's looking at other people's profiles because isn't that how you would learn yes. how to craft your yep. persona, how yep. to posture yourself? Yeah. Because <laughs> in one scene where he's uh, inadvertently uh, invited to a group sex scene and apparently paid handsomely for it, somebody clocks him is like, oh, you're new to this. Right. Shouldn't you want, for your own craft, uh, know the ropes? <laughs> because he's telling everyone he did research to write these pages, but then he keeps contradicting himself because he says that, oh, everyone that I interviewed, they feel very secure in their choice. But then he also, at one point, like his writings would indicate that there's some shame. So that doesn't quite make sense. And then without him researching what it is to be a sex worker, meaning like you should probably hire a prostitute to see how they treat you, wouldn't all of your experiences, which you're basically writing down verbatim, wouldn't they read as like novice encounters? Yeah. So uh -huh. I think that was an obvious omission that, again, I'm sure was deliberate, but it left me feeling like this kid is just embarking on this weird journey that no one needed. Like, it, it, Right. It's deliberate in the crafting, I guess, of his perspective, but it doesn't make sense. It's contradictory when it comes to everybody else's reactions. But that's what makes, it. but that's why I wrote that it's frustratingly accurate because I have known many p young people who do dumb shit that as a middle aged person, I'm like, you know, there's a better way to do this. Or like, you know, you'd be more successful if you tried this, but people have to learn in their own way. So I think upon finishing the movie, I felt like I see Max making these weird decisions <laughs> that are not helping him. The frustrating part was that experiencing an interaction with people like that is boring and frustrating, but also it's frustrating. And I think you are alluding to this when you say 
the word privilege, is that ultimately it works out for him. Yeah. Like, he... He's not scarred by his experience, it would seem. He does experiment with drugs and doesn't seem to get roped into that. And then now he's like a published author with really pretty pictures on the internet. Yeah, so. now he can walk with away with a red badge of courage to say that I made it through this. And it's like, okay. Um, it remind, You know, I've read Larry Kramer's work, his most notable novel maybe being The F Slur. <laughs> <laughs> Plural, uh, and I felt that was boring because, and but at the time that was published, everybody thought he was blowing the lid off the reality of you know queer experiences. And it's like, but I find it funny. The most stressful thing is from the publisher is all these notes he's getting. He's constantly getting messages about getting notes. That shit's stressful. But one of the early notes is that it's really repetitive. Yeah, because there. What is this character that he's writing about? What is the catal What is the dramatic catalyst? Where are they going? Because right. if you're just talking about somebody working, well, uh, a bus driver is always just going to be driving a bus. A sex worker is going to be having sex, you know, with some discrepancies in kind of the same way with all of these people. So what is this about? Yeah, that was frustrating, and that's my next note: is that the publisher is giving him these notes, but ultimately, it's like, what do you think you're buying from him? What is this sex worker going to ultimately achieve? Because I don't want, like, do your readers just want to read, uh, like, an anthology of sexual encounters by one person, or is he going to ultimately like kill someone? Or it's nonfiction, so the publisher can ask for anything, right? And uh, but also the character and the real person of the story are doing things in our, they're using, yes, a social media or a social platform to secure their clientele. But the process, once you get there, is an archaic way of working in the oldest profession. Once you get there, the editor publisher is talking about the digital hustler. It's like, well, OnlyFans is brought up a couple times, but the purpose of those sexual interactions is not necessarily for pleasure, but for the furtherance of a greater uh, digital imprint for more followers. And uh, to me, that isn't that what he should be exploring? I yeah, I, I, I almost wish that the publisher didn't say that because at a point, Max slash Sebastian is at a literary event because he's been nominated for some award, I think. And his publisher introduces him to some important people. And she says, oh, he's right. He's too embarrassed to explain what he's writing about because he's distracted because he sees one of his clients in the room, which we knew was coming. So the publisher has to basically say, oh, he's writing a novel on sex work in the digital age. But like you just said, I feel like that was probably the more interesting aspect of what he's doing. There is mention of like the difference because he has a conversation. He's part of like some book club, writer's club. I was very confused what it was, but he gets together more than once with a group of people who read passages from their works out loud and then they critique each other, mm -hmm. which was interesting. And at one point he's having a conversation and they are trying to sort of explain like the like do people even still hire escorts which is supposed to be uncomfortable because well this dummy over here is doing it but no one knows i thought that played kind of odd because it's almost like especially because we get a line later on saying that there are generational aspects mm -hmm. like connecting generations of gay men which of course usually relates back to aids that also was of interest to me, especially with the character played by Jonathan Hyde. Hyde. Mm -hmm. I actually found him to be the most interesting character. I did too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so I, it, it all ties back to what this, if the entire motivation for this plot moving forward is that this character is working as a prostitute to write this book, we, we never know what he thinks this book was going to be. And then again, not knowing how he came to the conclusion to actually become a prostitute makes me feel like the stakes are very low the stakes are very low and it's just it, he just seems more than naive he just seems dumb in a lot of ways to me because he well one a, a dramatic moment is one of his clients we see twice daniel played by ingvar sigurdsson the great icelandic actor we actually see completely naked which i was probably more shocking than almost anything else in this um he has a second not very good encounter with him because Sebastian gets too drunk. He says, can we wait until morning? And Daniel's like, do I remind you that you're, you're I working? I paid for you to have sex with me right now. You're working, sir. Uh, and he, he urges him to use a condom. And then in the morning, he wakes up to transcribe his experience. And Daniel looks at his laptop and gets upset because what he's, what, how 
uh, Sebastian wrote it is as a sexual assault is how that reads, because he didn't want to perform. And this man gets mad, destroys his laptop, and keeps his wallet, uh, which is kind of like the... And Sebastian has traveled to Brussels, to Brussels to be so he's not in London anymore. Which is kind of the pseudo rock bottom moment of that. But it's like, even throughout all of that, it, he, every choice he makes is stupid. But again, it, see, it is stupid, I agree, and it was frustrating, but it's also like I could see someone like him making these decisions. So it all feels authentic. It's just not a very satisfying... It's, but who's being satisfied by the text that he's writing of this person making these dumb decisions? Well, right. That's what's so odd to me, but... And then we're, we're doing call especially with the Jonathan Hyde character, you know, as the elder gay, bringing up Edward Albee and Tennessee Williams, and um, at one point... Sebastian pulls out a copy of Cyril Collard's uh, Savage Nights, uh, and th there's some brief conversations with that. And you can, I sense that the director screenwriter is trying to elevate this in a way that's in conversation with these, you know, iconic writer, queer writers from the past, but it just doesn't get there. And what I also want to talk about with Daniel is it precipitates the conversation where Sebastian shows Jonathan his passages that he's written about him. He's like, do you hate me? Do you hate me for using you like this? And it's like, you are a sex worker. This isn't Truman Capote using his swans that ruined his career right. because these socialites can see the thinly veiled of themselves in there. There's no guarantee that these Johns are even aware of you writing or will ever see this. I think another issue is there's like, like there's no humor in this. And I feel like there are moments where humor might have been necessary, like the situation you described. It's like, bitch, you're a hoe. Okay, calm down. Like he's, and the insufferable part of my pull quote is that he, Sebastian slash Max always looks like alarmed or uncomfortable. He has this look on his face. It's like, what are you doing, dude? Like, I don't know that his demeanor matches every situation. No, and it's like, are you owning this? Or again, I think it's satisfying, it's supposed to be satisfying something in him he's never been able to explore. And this is the facade with which is he is able to be sexual, but it's not really him. And I think there are some interesting ways in which we as queer men compartmentalize those aspects of ourselves, but this, this is, it, it just feels like it's losing the ball in really exploring those kind of He's a 25-year-old, attractive young man living in a big city in the modern era. He works for a progressive situation where everyone around him seems to be a little more, I mean, it almost seems like they're more comfortable with the prospect of what he's doing than he is. Yeah. So it just doesn't, so really the only aspect of his life where I thought, oh, there could be some issues with your mother. So then why didn't we spend more time with her? Exactly. And the only time we do spend with her, she kind of tells him like, I love you. I'm proud of you. You know, I worry about you out there by yourself. And like, I don't know what you're doing. And basically he says, well, I have friends. Don't worry about me. So it's like, what are we worried about? Or also exploring the reality of this dark, because a part of our very long conversation we had after this was knowing people that, you know, have dabbled in escort work and then kind of become full fledged they get consumed. They get, they're they consumed. And you can see that this this environment is, I mean, that's the reason he ruins the Brett S. Easton Ellis moment because he sleeps in for work after going to this group sex party right. where he does drugs. I and mean, then ultimately gets fired from the magazine because he chooses to leave an interview early to go to a hookup. Right. Uh, yeah. So the, the, the allure of this uh, kind of, if you don't uh, handle it the right way, what can be a very toxic profession. He, so... The publisher says, you know, like these these stories you're writing are great, but I feel like it's just a series of this character sleeping with older men. It's kind of all the same. Maybe we can get something different. And it's like, well, what do you want? So then that night he gets a call and he goes to the job and it's a group situation and he was not aware. But then he flashes back to what his boss said. I think he actually gets a text. There's a text like, oh, my notes aren't too mean. Right. So then he's like, I guess I should do this thing I've never done before, which is have group sex. And also they're using drugs. They're using a drug called mephedrine, mm -hmm. which I've never heard which of. Which I hadn't heard of either, but, but sounds like it would help you in those situations. But as a result of partying all night, he ends up missing a meeting with his boss, which is what leads to him not getting the Brett Easton Ellison review. And that is it Ellis or Ellis? Ellis. Sorry. Uh, and then, um, it's also during that group session that one of the guys who you already alluded to says you must be a newbie tells him, oh, do you want to collab on my OnlyFans? 
And then I thought, this, this movie's kind of meta because we have this character pretending to be an escort, writing about it, and then getting feedback saying like, this is kind of played out, no one wants to see this. And as the person watching the movie, I'm like, this is kind of played out. Like, am I, good, am I just watching him have sex with old men and then kind of develop a situationship with Jonathan Hyde's character? Mm -hmm. So it it was an interesting feeling to have characters in the movie sort of say what I'm feeling watching the movie, uh -huh. which is that this is kind of like but not boring. Push, but not pushing the envelope when it's teasing at doing so, such as that escort telling Sebastian that you have you're that all not all American, but you're whatever he calls him uh, type of persona, but it's all filth underneath and. Seeing how those kind of notes that he's getting about himself as a sexual person are crafting his approach to the two interactions we see him have that aren't that he's not being his services aren't being paid for. One with that young man in the club who seems kind of mad that he rebuffs him to go, you know, meet somebody to get have paid sex with, and then a book club, a book, cl a book club uh, colleague who he, he has very aggressive, rough sex with, and the guy's like, "Slow down, it's not a porno." Yeah, I, which is also that felt like an authentic scene as well because these young people that just don't realize that you shouldn't shit where you eat. Well, getting back to the Jonathan Hyde's character, when he we realize that he's starting to feel connected to him because Jonathan's character says, "Oh, I think our time is up." And Seba Max, or Sebastian, I guess, says, I'd like to stay. Well, I really can't afford. And then he puts his finger on his mouth and goes, not him, me. Like, forget about Sebastian, Max wants to stay. <laughs> and I think that relationship felt a little underdeveloped. Because as, like, I... Again, I guess it feels accurate. Like, this stupid kid doesn't know what he's doing. But then I also felt like, what is... It's just not very interesting to witness. Like, I understand why Jonathan Hyde's character likes it because this attractive man wants to be in bed with me and I don't have to pay. But for Max, Sebastian, I didn't understand what he's getting from this. He seems fulfilled in other ways. Uh huh. And then it's like, oh, so this man who knows literature is speaking your language. But you're also around a lot of other people who speak your language who are more your speed. Mm -hmm. But then I guess I don't know what your speed is because we're not talking about what you actually want. I think what I needed at that moment is that once Jonathan Hyde discovers the duality of Max last Sebastian, that we get a Catherine Hepburn monologue that he does from Sunday last summer. So you already talked about this, but when Sebastian reunites with Jonathan Hyde's character, whose name is Nicholas, he allows him to read uh, the portion he wrote about him, essentially. And then that's what inspires him to then complete the draft of his book in the first person. But we don't know how he wrote it. Did he keep in the Nicholas part or did he make it something different like his publisher wanted? But whatever he did worked. And then he's walking into a book signing now that he's like a big deal. And the person, I guess, doing the Q&A asks him like, oh, I like, did you read over my questions? Is there anything that I shouldn't ask you? And... Sebastian says, you can ask me anything. That's the final line of the movie. Cue Jesse Ware playing over the credits. And yeah. it kind of bothered me because I just felt like, of course, like this perfect little guy gets to like have his cake and eat it too. Yeah, like, he's unscathed. He's rewarded, in fact. And there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, no. like I, I think a lot of us have done things that probably could have ruined us and then we end up, I mean, look at me now. But so I'm not hating him for that. I just think that He's a kind of a boring character who ultimately wins. So then it, like, there was very little emotion I felt, very little fear. Well, it's like, what greater truth are we trying to get at about relationships, about, about like, being a, a gay man, a young gay man in 2024? I think something like Sequin in a Blue Room navigates that better, at least in the sexscape. This feels way. like, I mean, I can recall like not too long ago I went out uh, and this like younger, like 20 something year old person was talking to me about living in LA and trying to tell me like about living in LA and it's like, <laughs> and I just let him talk and it, 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 it kind of felt like that. Like I'm just looking at this dumb, dumb, like you don't, you obviously don't know me and what I've accomplished. So I like, I guess you can explain to me how to make a life in the city I was born and raised in, and I'm currently thriving in. That's kind of how I feel watching 
this movie. Uh huh. Yes. What would you give? I mean, it made me want to go back and rewatch something like Beauty by Oliver Hermanus, but um, it, I would give it two and a half. I think it's again, it's an interesting conversation mm -hmm. piece because uh, there is a lot that it gets right, but. I think what's more frustrating, it, it's all the more frustrating because of that, because we have this boring central performance, lead character that needs wings. I would give Sebastian two and a half out of five. Join us on Patreon and listen to our podcast. Bye.